Amen. Be seated. Now, if you haven't already done so, open your Bibles to the book of Romans first, chapter 3. I'll tell you what verses in just a moment. The book of Romans in the New Testament. If you're new to the Word, don't worry. We've got Bibles right here in the pews in front of you. And in the front of those Bibles are the table of contents. <laughs> and I'm not speaking down to you. I know a lot of people are new in the Word and those watching by live stream. And if you don't know where books are, as I call them out, then just look at the table of contents. That's what it's there for. And familiarize yourself with the Word and head on over to the book of Romans. It's in the New Testament. All right, the book of Romans, chapter 3, we'll begin there. And then we'll be in Luke chapter 18. Of course, that's the, fourth, the third gospel of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right in the beginning of the New Testament. Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. There we go. All right, Romans chapter 3. I'll tell you the verse in just a moment. So sometimes I am asked the question, so how, how were people saved in the Old Testament? And a lot of times, I mean, and, and I know the answer and I love to give it, but I also like for people to think a little bit. I don't embarrass them and grill them and drill them. So I'll just simply ask, well, what, 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 would, what might be your idea before I answer the question as to how people were saved? And oftentimes people will say, well, I believe they were saved under the law. They were saved by the law. And, and well, what law are you referring to? Usually, of course, they would say the Ten Commandments. And that's true. The Ten Commandments kind of encapsulate the law. And then Jesus in the gospel said there are really two commandments that encapsulate everything. But the Ten Commandments are not all of the law. As a matter of fact, the Orthodox rabbis will tell you that they have counted probably several thousand years ago. And they can tell you that there are exactly 616 commandments, admonitions, and thou shouts in the entire Old Testament, which is the only thing they'll look at, the Orthodox Jews, 616. And so when they speak of the law, that's what they mean. But more importantly, often what they will mean, and it's sad to me and to those of us that are born again, they also mean that you take those 616 and whatever the rabbis have added to the understanding and how we live out those laws. And those laws at first become rituals, then they become tradition, and then they are equal to and sometimes supersede the real law. And Jesus got on to them about that in the New Testament. He said, you nullify the word of God by holding to your traditions. So nothing I'm saying here is hasn't been said before out of the mouth of Jesus himself. I'm just putting it in our language right here. The law, the law. Is that how people, you don't have to answer out loud, I'm just being rhetorical here. Is that how people were saved in the Old Testament? Were people saved in the law and were saved by Jesus? And so there's two completely different constructs here. The answer to that question is no. And the Bible is very clear. Old Testament and New Testament. But of course, we're going to be in the New Testament this morning because it is stated succinctly and clearly because of the connection to everything that Jesus Christ did. He fulfilled all the law so that in him we can be cleansed from the commandments of the law that none of us can keep. You say, well, why would God give it if none of us could keep it? Well, we're going to find out here in just a moment. But this is important because after we understand this, this biblical principle, then we're going to go and we're going to see an application of it as we read a very real account that actually happened to Jesus in the last few weeks before he would go to the cross. He was on his way from the Galilee area down the Jordan River Road, then up to Jericho, and then up to Jerusalem, and then into on Palm Sunday in the gate, the eastern gate, and, and then back up on Mount of Olives for several nights, and then back into Jerusalem, and finally winding up on the cross, and then the empty tomb. But this is still several weeks out from that, and we will see an application of it wherein if you don't know what we're getting to discover what we're getting ready to discover here with our eyes and our spirit first that account might seem a little odd but when we understand this i think you'll see it much clearer and so you're going to see some things, you're going to learn some things, you're going to put some perspective and some context to things that will make your understanding of God's word much sharper, much clearer, 
a lot more in context, but just as important and actually for this day and the days to come, even more importantly than learning stuff about the Bible, which is very important, study to show thyself approved, a workman able to accurately handle the word of God, right? That's what Paul told Timothy. But all of that is important. But once we have that, then the next most important thing is, what does it mean to us as we walk through these doors and out into this crazy world? Have you noticed how crazy this world is? I'm just wondering. There's a lot of people that haven't because they ain't here or in any other church under any other word. They're out there in that crazy world thinking everything's just lovely and running after all the things that the world runs after. Just like it was in the days of Noah. Just like it was in the days of Lot. Which, by the way, Jesus says when we get to Luke 18, guess what? In Luke 17, along that same way, and I've preached this so many times here, and I've written books about it, but on that same way, that's when he was confronted just a week or two before he'd go to the cross. Tell us, what are the signs of the coming of the Son of Man, the return? Of course, the Jews were looking for the first coming. Here he was. He had already come. But what is the sign of the coming when, when, when Messiah comes and conquers in their mind, the Roman Empire, so Israel can be the king among nations again. But that's not why Jesus came. He's conquered Satan's kingdom. He's conquered the world. He taught us to pray, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Thy entire kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? So they're going to ask him in, ch in chapter 17 of Luke, they're going to ask him that question. So chapter 18 is after he's answered the question, and he's still walking along the way, headed to Jericho, then to Jerusalem. But the question was, tell us what are your signs? And his answer was, it'll be just like the days of Noah and just like the days of Lot. And one of the defining features of both of those times, Noah and Lot separated by a long time, yet their days ended in the wrath of God being poured out, the flood in Noah's day and fire from heaven in Lot's day. But the distinguishing general feature of both days was that the people just went on with their lives as though the judgment of God would never come. Even though they were preachers of righteousness and God's people among them, namely Lot and his family in his day, Noah and his family in his day, but there were people among, I mean, Noah was building an aircraft carrier sized ship in his backyard. And then he would stand up on it and preach when the crowds came to oogle and google and goggle at it. It's like Disneyland to them. And they were told. And they were given chances to repent and to be saved. But they loved the things of the world more. And pretty soon the world that they were clinging to was gone. Every bit of it. And so were their lives, and so were their eternities. And Jesus said, it's going to be just like that. Now, those are just that's just the overarching feature of the days of Noah and days of Lot. I've written several books. I've preached and taught prophecy conferences and sermons in here from this pulpit and on Sunday nights of the details of the days of Noah and the details of the days of Lot. And every one of them are now here in this generation, and they sweep the planet and not just an area of the world or a country or two of the world. The, the spirit of the days of Noah and the days of Lot and the details of what happened in those days are now happening at lightning speed all over the planet and only in our generation and they only started pouring out over the last 10 or 20 years and most of them over the last 5 or 6 years. That's all I'm going to say about that but I'm putting all of this in context. We're going to learn this principle about how were people saved then and how were people saved now and what's the place of the law? Then we're going to go on that road where Jesus has just said this about the last days. And he's going to come across a situation that he will speak to directly. It's a little odd if you don't know what we're getting ready to discover from Romans 3. Is everybody with me so far? All right. I've already given you a ton of material right there, but I haven't drawn it together yet, though. And that's what I want to do. 
So the question is, are we, how are they saved? People will often say they're saved by the law. What law? Well, the Ten Commandments. Interesting. People have never, ever, ever, ever been saved by keeping the law. Ever. Now, I know that raises a lot of questions in your mind if you haven't been a student of the word long or if you have fallen asleep while I've preached before <laughs> because I've answered the question. And I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not insulted by that. Sometimes I have to stay awake. Okay, keep preaching, Carl. I'll keep preaching. But, but, but the point is, I promise you, no one has ever been saved by keeping the law. Number one, no one can keep the law. And even when you're thinking you're keeping the letter of the law, you're not keeping the spirit of the law because we live and fall in by. Jesus cleared that up when he says, you have heard it said that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you have ever lusted over someone else, you have committed adultery in your heart and the Lord sees the heart. So have we ever broken the law? Yes. You have heard it said, thou shalt not do any murder. But I say to you, if you hate someone in your heart, and the implication is that in your heart you've thought, if there was any way I could kill him and get away with it, I'd do it. <laughs> Guilty. The law has never saved anyone because, number one, we can't keep the law. <laughs> we cannot keep it. We are fallen. And number two, because the law wasn't given for the purpose of salvation. It was given for two more very important purposes. Romans chapter 3, Paul is going to address this. Because the church was largely Jewish. Now, these were Jewish people that had called upon Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew is how it would be. Jesus Christ is how we would say it in English. They had called upon Yeshua HaMashiach, committing to him as Lord and Savior, and repenting of their sin before him. But so many of the Jewish people in the early church, even the church at Rome, still had this, this somehow this idea that if I keep the law, somehow God loves me more. And somehow I'm even more guaranteed of a ticket to heaven. <laughs> so Paul answers this. And listen to what he says. Romans chapter 3, look at verse 19. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. And there's a reason for that. I'm going to explain that in a moment. So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Let's stop right there. Don't read any further. I'm going to keep reading. Look at me. It means you too, brother. <laughs> I love it when we come to church, everybody says, but I like the word of God. Good. That's so cool. But listen, what? He says the law is given for those under the law. Say, so, well, what does that mean? Aren't we all under law? That's what the next verse basically says. So that the whole world will be silenced and have to give an account. Just to put it plainly, the law was given, number one, so that nobody could ever stand before the Lord and say, well, you owe me heaven because I kept your little ten rules. Can you imagine God saying, oh, my gosh, you've got me over a barrel. <laughs> come on in. I didn't want you to come in, but you're right. I mean, I, we checked it off, and you've kept all the rules. But, see, we, we know that you can't anyway because God judges the heart as well as the actions, right? Yeah. We can fool other people with our outward actions or even fool ourselves, but we're not fooling the Lord. 
He knows our heart. He knows what we think. He knows the attitude. He knows the reason why we keep the law. If we're doing it to fool others, to gain an advantage over other people, God knows that too. And that counts against us. So the law was given to show something of God's righteousness and his expectation to every living person that draws breath, that has any capability at all of understanding God's law through the word. We are held accountable. The whole earth is held accountable. Some of it is just written on our hearts. I love it when the atheists try to say, well, there's no such thing as absolute morality. Morality is just a construct. It's a concept that shifts and changes throughout generations in whatever culture. And you can see that going on in our own culture where they're trying desperately to shift the whole moral plane and to say, well, we've accepted. Supreme Court has said it's okay. Well, the White House says it's okay. Uh, institutions of America say it's okay. So, by gosh, this is the new law. This is the new, but in our hearts, especially those of us that are born again, we grieve. See, this is the days of Lot. It says, this man was vexed, that's the King James, just torn apart in his righteous heart as he saw and lived in the midst of the evil every single day. And the implication is he was telling them, please turn from your sin. Please, and they, they were, they, you know, you're not politically correct. We're going to report you to the authorities. You're a hater. Cancel his Twitter account. Take him off Facebook. Amen. Right? Yes. Amen. That's what he lived in. Yeah. So it was given. Absolute morality. Watch this. Here's the reason the law was given. You say, what about people who can't read the Bible or don't understand the language or whatever? Listen to this. First of all, the Bible says, you can just look into the stars at night. Romans 1 says, look at the creation around you. It testifies that you have been created and that there is a God. His invisible power is seen every single day by our eyes. We will be held accountable for that. The whole world will be. Nobody will be able to stand before the throne and say, well, I, I didn't even know there was a God. How could you not know? How could you not know? So Satan has come up with a construct for that. Well, it happened by accident. You see, billions of years ago in a slimy mud pit. Wait, where'd the mud come from? Where'd the pit come from? Where'd the slime come from? Where did the earth come from that held the slime and the mud in the pit? Well, it was a big bang. Where did the bang come from? Where did the energy come from? Where did the molecules and the elements come from that created it? By the way, who gave the word for the big bang? What gave the word for the big bang? I mean, you know, God's, God's going to say, you have no excuse just by what has been made. Now let's talk about absolute morality. See, the world says there's no such thing as absolute morality. And here's the answer I give. Never have I had anyone be able to to deal with it, who was trying to put it in my face that absolute morality is just a social construct. I said, okay, I've got two questions for you. May I come to your house tonight, destroy your children before your eyes in whatever vile way I can imagine, destroy your wife before your eyes in any vile way I can imagine, steal everything out of your house I want, then burn your house to the ground. Is that okay with you? Is it okay with any of you? As a matter of fact, Mr. Smarty Bridges, that said there's no such thing as absolute morality, let me ask you, is there any culture on the planet where anybody would allow anybody to do that and then turn to them and say, that's okay, in fact, I kind of like that. You know why? Because every one of those things and all the vileness that goes with it is in the heart of all 8 billion of us on this planet. Oh, we can argue about other little fine points of life, but when it comes down to absolute morality, there are lines that we just, in our hearts, oh, we may live them out and cross over them, but I'm talking about in our hearts and minds of a collective culture of 8 billion people, there's not a culture on the planet and not a sane person or sane family in this world that would say, Carl, you can come on over and do that at our house tonight. We don't care. Am I telling the truth? 
So we're hearing here that the law was given. The Ten Commandments, ten little rules and regulations. You know? Don't, don't worship a bunch of demons. <laughs> don't have no other gods before you. Don't make a bunch of statues and platforms and invite them to come. Pull out a Ouija board and say, speak to us, oh spirits. What, what are you doing? God says, don't do that junk. Build an altar to Baal and put up a statue and then dance around it all night in a drug-induced frenzy and look for the spirits to come to bless you. You say, well, that's that old stuff. There are altars of Baal all over this world still. I mean literal altars of Baal as well as symbolic ones. In fact, there's a, there's a, a holiday to Baal every year. It's called Beltane. I see a lot of y'all hadn't read my books. I, 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 I'm telling you, folks, this is not just stuff I'm making up, pulling out of my back pocket. It's not some philosophical ranting of a crazy preacher. I am crazy, but it's not that. <laughs> this stuff is real, and God says, don't do this, don't do this. Don't, don't, don't use God's name as a curse word in your mind, in your spirit, with your mouth. And not just a curse word, but just use it in vain. Like it's a magic word or like it's some superstitious thing or, you know, well, I was talking to the man upstairs the other day. I hear people say that stuff all the time. Sometimes right here in this community, people that go to church all the time and I know them and I'll say something. Lord been good to you. Oh, the man upstairs has blessed me. Why not say Jesus Christ has blessed me. Amen. It's a flippant use of using God's name in vain. See, this is why I'm saying none of us can keep this stuff. Honor the day of the Lord, which honors the day of creation. Keep it holy. Keep a day holy unto the Lord. We know that Jesus fulfilled even that. So if we're in Jesus Christ, we're keeping the Sabbath. But what are we doing here today? On the Lord's Day, the day that celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we gather ourselves and we're under that fourth commandment, blessing fulfilled in Jesus Christ. 98% of this county is not found anywhere honoring that commandment. According to the statistics, we've run those statistics by you before. 200,000 people in this county. I mean, you can go on and on. Honor your father and mother. Don't commit murder. Don't, don't, don't steal. Don't, don't uh, commit adultery. And don't covet. And we, can, we can't do it. So just those 10, not counting the other 606. Are you following me? They were given so that we would know something of the heart of God and that we from it would see that that's not our Savior. Our Savior is not the law. Keep reading this. So that the whole world would be accountable to God. Verse 26. Therefore, no one, no, how many is no one? Every, everyone, all eight billion of us, none of us will be declared righteous. What does righteous mean? Saved. Under the blood. None of us will be declared righteous or good enough to get into heaven only by that. In his sight, by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The law was meant to turn people to a relationship with their heavenly father, a loving, true relationship. As we live the law, we see we can't keep the law. We see that the law comes right from God's heart and soul and mind. And when we realize we can't, then we realize, oh, what a sinner I am. What's wrong with me? And not just me, what's wrong with the other eight billion people? What is wrong? So that we would become conscious of our sin and the sin nature that exists throughout the planet. And so that the entire world would be accountable to the Lord. There is no one that's ever going to be able to stand before the Lord and say, Oh, I was good as Carl Gallup's, so you and he was a preacher for you. And he's going to heaven, so I should go to heaven. 
And the answer to that is, Carl Gallup's didn't die on a cross. The standard's not Carl Gallup's. And the only reason Carl Gallup's is going to heaven is because he did what you didn't do. He bowed his knee and said, Jesus, please save me. Amen. You see? So we don't compare ourselves to each other because all 8 billion of us are under the law together and none of us can keep the law. All right, so why even give the law? Well, one of the answers is given right here very clearly so that the whole world is accountable. And so that it would convict us of our need for a savior. We don't need another rule or regulation. We need a savior, right? Amen. Everybody got me? Amen. This is important stuff. Answers a lot of questions. Sets a lot of things straight. Messes with the minds of a lot of atheists and agnostics. They got to deal with that before God. Well, I still don't believe. Well, that's between you and the Lord then. You'll see. So why give it in the first place? Fathers, grandfathers, mothers, grandmothers. Do you have rules for your family, for your children and your grandchildren? Yes. You know they're not going to keep them, don't you? Yep. So the first time they don't keep it, you kick them out the door and they're no longer your children or grandchildren. You hate them forever. How about the second time? How about the 1,000th time? So why do you give the law? Because there has to be family rules. There are expectations that are laid down. There's something that we have to be accountable to. And discipline comes and privileges are withheld. Blessings that we want. You know, you got two children in your family and one of them is just, no one's perfect, but they're just kind of keeping the family rules and keeping a good chin up and making it right when they mess one up. And then you got another one that's just a pure rebel. It's not always this way in families, but the way it should be is, is the one that is trying with all of their heart to keep the family rules and be an obedient child is the one that opens their lives up to more blessings. Doesn't mean you hate the other one, but it's just you cannot feed the beast that will be rebellious. If you do, you're feeding the rebellion when there are no consequences. Am I right? This is a thing that gets families in trouble. They feed the beast and ignore the one that's keeping the law. Okay? That's another whole sermon. And nobody amended it, so I know I've ticked a lot of people off. But anyway, now grandparents are really, <laughs> we're really horrible at that, right? <laughs> Bring that little beast here. Come here, but what you want? <laughs> and then send them back to mom and dad, right? <laughs> We're having fun with it. I'm saying all of this to agree with the word of God. No, it can't be the law that saves us. It's something deeper. It's something way more relational than just rules and regulations and men walking around in black robes and tassels and phylacteries on their head and, and going into the synagogues and saying, here's what we say. Be like us and God will love you. And that's the way it was and still is today. But now you know the truth. No one has ever kept the law. No one can keep the law, either in physical keeping of it or in the spirit of it. Eight billion people on the planet, nobody can do it. Nobody. Some can play the game better than others. Some can fool more people than others. But none of us in our heart, our mind, our spirit, our soul, and even in our actions by the time we've lived out our life, we cannot keep God's heart as it's expressed in the law. But even as children of God who are under the blood of Jesus, we are forgiven, but that gives us freedom. Then the law is written on our heart, the Bible says, and we just know, we just know. I don't have to pray about whether or not I should commit adultery on my wife. Y'all hear me? Yeah. I don't have to pray about whether I should go out and kill the person that has made me mad and right now I'm pretty hot and if I thought I could get away with it, I would. But the Holy Spirit speaks to me. I don't have to go find a law for it. It's written on my heart. I don't have to pray that, that, that I shouldn't let some vile thing that has God's name attached to it come out of my mouth. It's already written on my heart. Does this make sense? Why? Because I'm born again. I'm under the blood. The Holy Spirit of God lives within me. The law is there for all of that, plus so that the whole world is accountable to God. Nobody will stand in his presence and say, 
you got to let me in. I'm as good as Carl Gallup's. Does that make sense? Follow me now to Luke 18. We're following Jesus along the road from Lake Galilee up in the northern part of Israel, headed south, and then they're going to turn. They're going to turn west and go up to Jericho. They're going to go from there up the mountain to Bethany, which is on the Mount of Olives, just outside the Temple Mount, but they're in Jerusalem, and then from there they'll go inside the gates of the old city. And from there Jesus will be crucified. So they're on this journey. In Luke 17, he's already told them, listen, the last days, you've asked the question, so I'm going to tell you the last days will be like the days of Noah. The last days will be like the days of Lot. Then, chapter 18, they're still moving along from village to village, synagogues in every village, Pharisees in every village, important people within the synagogues in every village, verse 18. Along the way, verse 18. Now a certain ruler asked him, let me just tell you who a ruler is. They're called rulers of the synagogues. Have you ever heard that term before? You read it, it's in the New Testament. That's not maybe the chief rabbi, and it's, it's, it's not even the scribes, and it's not the Pharisees. It was a position in the church, or excuse me, in the synagogue. The word church means called out ones under Jesus Christ, but synagogue is just a, a, a word. It means, it means um, uh, a meeting place. So it can be used in many different ways, but when you think of a synagogue in that context, you're thinking of a place where the Jews would gather and meet and worship, all right? The ruler of the synagogue, that's just a fancy term, meaning the, the one who was in charge of many things, <laughs> kind of like church administrator, just did all the stuff concerning building and placement of everything. and Like when the scrolls were handed down to the preachers and then they would put the scrolls up. They didn't have Bibles. They had a, a big compartment, like a, like a big uh, uh, hutch or something, and it had the scrolls of all of the books in the Bible. And so if someone got up to preach, like when Jesus got up in one of the synagogues and says the scroll of Isaiah was given to him. It was open to where he wanted it opened. He read from it. Then he sat down. That was the seat. That was like me standing up here. We stand behind a pulpit most of the time, but the ancient Jews would sit down and teach. Now, the problem is with this is that what do I do about getting back up right now? <laughs> All right. I know some of y'all were thinking that, but, but they would sit down and teach. I've even done that from time to time. I've pulled a stool up here and sat down, and I didn't need it, you know, praise God. It may come a time in my life when I will, but I did it without even saying anything. And, and I noticed that the people were just like focused. And it was like, we need to listen to daddy. He's going to tell us a story. You know, there's something about being seated in a, in, a, in a place like that and teaching from there that focuses people. That's how it was done in the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue was responsible for all of the affairs of the building and that everything worked and that everything was open and shut on time and the handling of the scrolls. Also, they were responsible for picking the one who would preach that day. It wasn't always the rabbi. Sometimes there was a visiting guest. That's why you see Paul preaching in the synagogues from time to time. That's why Jesus was preaching in the synagogue. If they found out, if the ruler of the synagogue found out that an important personality was going to be there that day, they would go up to him even before the service and say, listen, would you like to be the one to bring the word this morning? And they would, and the ruler would report back to the rabbi, and it would all be done. Does that make sense? I just want you to know who we're talking about here. So in one of these villages, here is a ruler of a synagogue. And they're going to further describe him. Luke is going to further describe him as it was told to him by Jesus and Peter and the disciples when he wrote this. He was not only the ruler, but he was filthy rich and he was young. So he probably hadn't earned that money. He probably had come into that money. So he was young, full of health and Vigor and vinegar, <laughs> like we say here in the South. And he already had a badge on his chest in the synagogue. He was important. That was a, that was a high administrative place and actually got to choose who preached every, every, every Sabbath. 
the rich young ruler we know him as, we read this and people struggle with this. But after what you've already learned, you shouldn't struggle with this at all. Because Jesus is going to ask him a question. And if you don't know what Romans 3 says and what the whole word of God tells us, you would think that Jesus doesn't know what Romans 3 says and the whole word of God. Why? This man asks Jesus a question. Jesus answers in a way that implies Jesus thinks the way you're saved is by keeping the law. But that's not what Jesus is getting at. He's getting at Romans 3, as you will see. Watch. So a certain ruler, and as I said, the other gospels call him rich and young, asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Now stop for a moment. Just as he had inherited his wealth, <laughs> maybe even his position in the synagogue. He's heard. Now Jesus has been out there operating for three years. Maybe he's even seen. Maybe he was in some of the crowds where he saw some of the miracles. Where We don't know, but he knew who Jesus was. Called him good teacher. What, what good thing must I do? Some of the other Gospels have him say, meaning the same thing here. What thing do I have to do to inherit good life? I mean, eternal life, to inherit it. What do I have to do to, you know, to have it handed to me? Now listen. First, Jesus said, why do you call me good? Now listen, here's the hint of where Jesus is going with all of this. No one is good except God alone. Now, you know what that means? If keeping the law makes us good, then we can be equal to God just by keeping some rules and regulations. But we are fallen, and we can't, which shows us we need a Savior, not a, another rule, right? But yet the rules exist. They are the family. God's going to tell us his heart, and he tells us how he expects us to live. And when we fall, we got to plead the blood, and we got to make it right. A lost person won't do either one of those things. But if you're a child, an obedient child that still messes up and steps in the mud puddle, you got to make it right. And you got to plead the apologies in the family line, right? So Jesus answers him, why do you call me good? Nobody but God is good. So basically he's saying, you do realize if you keep calling me good, you're equating that I am God, which he is, was in that case, in the flesh. So he's also hinting to who he is. But he's also challenging the young man because Jesus knows what he's going to say next. Because the guy has asked, what good thing must I do? And you're the good teacher. Good, good, good. I want to be good. You're good. I'm good. I want to be good. I want to inherit eternal life like all the other things that have come to me in life. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Nobody but God is good. Look at this. When Jesus heard this, excuse me, excuse me. No one is good except God alone. Verse 20. He looks at the young man. He says, you know the commandments. You know the law. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Verse 21. All of these things I have kept. All of these things since I was a little boy, he said. I have in my Bible, just in parentheses here, I don't know why I wrote this, it says doubtful. <laughs> it's right there, blue ink in parentheses. I don't know, that's what the Holy Spirit was, made me write when I was there. I mean, because again, I don't know how old he is, but he's old enough to be the ruler of the synagogue. So he's probably in his late 20s, early 30s. And he's just since I was a boy. What you want to say is, how about before you were a boy? <laughs> But since I was a boy, I kept all of these. Well, it depends on what you mean kept. Have you ever lusted in your heart? Have you ever hated in your heart? Have you ever desired to have something that somebody else had? You came close to picking it up, put it in your pocket, but you didn't, but you were on your way to do it. But see, none of that was asked. Jesus just said, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother. And by the way, that's just several of the commandments, not all ten. Verse 21, all of these I've kept since I was a boy. Doubtful. My Bible says that, not your. All right. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, okay, but you still lack one thing. 
How about this? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now, when he heard this, the ruler, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, in fact Jesus is smiling while he's saying this. This is an ancient proverb. It's like me saying, you know what? I'd rather sort through a box of wildcats than deal with that person. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? That's a southern thing. I'd rather sort through a box of wildcats than to deal with that person who just came in the door. In other words, I just, it's impossible. You can't sort through a box of wildcats. And it's impossible for me to deal with that person. It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I mean, that's a funny picture, isn't it? It was meant to be. In that culture, in that day, that's like saying it's impossible for my four-wheel drive pickup truck to, go th to drive through an eye of a needle. Okay? Camels were, that's what they were. Those who heard this asked, well, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, you know, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Ooh. Peter said to him, well, we have, we, we, here's Peter sticking his foot in his mouth. <laughs> well, we've left, we left everything to follow you. You know what he was doing? He got right back into his orthodox Jewishness. Look how good I am. I'm a lot better than this guy. He's a ruler and he's rich and he's young of the synagogue. I've never even hardly been allowed in synagogues and I have to come in with you, you know, because of my mouth and, and my crustiness. Uh, but, but look, I'm better than him. We've, we've left everything to follow you. And the Lord has to gently kind of give perspective to that. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to all of them. No one has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. No one who has done that will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come will receive eternal life. Y'all listen to me. This parable, excuse me, this account, this is not a parable, this account of this young man coming out to meet Jesus Jesus' teaching was not testing to see if he'd kept the law because if he kept the law, that's how he could be saved. No, he was showing him what Paul says in Romans 3. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to listen to you. You're going to lie to me. <laughs> but you're going to put on a show and you don't think anybody knows, but because I'm God in the flesh standing right before you, it's doubtful when you tell me you've done all of that. But then he goes on to say, okay, you've kept all those. That's cool. But I can show you you've got another God before you. Won't you sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me? Now, I'm just going to say, he is not speaking against rich people, even though he says it's harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than to go through an eye of a needle. We'll talk about that and put that in balance in a moment. But he's not speaking against having wealth. He's not, he's, he's not saying, well, you gotta be, the only way you can be saved is to keep all the commandments. What he's trying to do, he's dealing with this young man. Jesus is God in the flesh. He knows this man's heart. He knows his heart. He knows his mind. He's got a lot of people fooled. He's young. He's vibrant. He inherited wealth. He's got a badge. He's in the synagogue. So therefore, he's got to be one who's going to go to heaven, right? I mean, he does some work in the synagogue. What did Jesus tell them in his very first sermon in Matthew chapter 7? Not everyone who just calls me Lord, Lord is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he says, and on that day there will be many standing before me saying, but Lord, didn't I do this in your name? And didn't I do that in your name? And he will say, depart from me because I never knew you. And that word knew doesn't mean no, of course he knows who he is. It meant I didn't ever have a personal, intimate relationship with you, and you didn't have that with me. You just did stuff and tagged my name onto it like a spare tire in your trunk. And you think, now I owe you heaven? When you never bowed your knee and emptied out your heart before me, 
when you never gave me thought during the day when you were going about your business, when every little thing that the world throws up in your face and goes, boo, you ran from it and hid in fear and you never called upon me to ease the fear and to give you the answer? Really? I didn't know you and you didn't know me. Is this making more sense? He was not telling the young man, if you keep all the laws, you can, you can go to heaven. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. Isn't that right, everybody? He had them all fooled. That's why I have there in parentheses, doubtful when you know everything Jesus said about that. But Jesus looked at him and says, yeah, but I do know something. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor. I don't know. People ask me all the time, well, what if he had sold everything and gave it to the poor and followed him? It wasn't a selling of what he had. I mean, Jesus might have. I'm just saying this. What if he said, okay, I'll go there, I'll go there. Jesus might have said, you don't have to sell it all, but sell enough that you can be unentangled from it and come follow me. See, the thing is, he said, come follow me, come follow me. It's just that Jesus knew what it was that was stopping him from that in his case. I know a lot of us would sit here and more say, man, I praise God. I'm not one of them rich fellers. I don't have millions and millions and millions of dollars. I'm guaranteed to get into heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying. In this man's case, that was his heart. That was his stumbling block. That was his problem. Jesus was testing it with the law, trying to show him what Romans 3 says. It's to show us we need a Savior. So, the rich man, hearing that, the Bible says, went away sad. When I read those words, I want to go, oh. And he was that close. But the world, it's clinging to it. And the stuff he had and the inheritance he got. He was probably adding up the figures when Jesus said, sell everything you have. Wait a minute, I've got millions. I ain't letting go of that. And come follow me. And he looks, he sees the disciples dressed just normally and him dressed normally and they're wandering up and down the road in their bare feet and sandaled feet and he's thinking, I ain't never had to live like that. Sleeping out under the stars at night. But he knows what Jesus has done. He knows that somehow he's connected to heaven. He knows about the miracles. He may have seen them himself. He knows about the preaching with authority. He may have even heard some of it himself. He wants some of that. He knows that this man could maybe give him the answer to eternal life. And guess what? He did. And the guy didn't get it. Eternal life is not about following rules and regulations. It's about following Jesus. And when we follow Jesus Christ, the rules and the regulations begin to be burnt into and seared into our hearts and our minds so that as we move through life, most of the time when it comes to thou shalt or thou shalt not, we don't even have to pray about it. Isn't that cool? I mean, that sounds like blasphemy for a preacher to say, you know, there's some things you don't even have to pray about. But it's the truth. It's the truth. If somebody offered me a million dollars, walked in the door and said, Preacher, I'll write you a check for a million dollars. This is good. You can ask anybody, but just quit preaching this word. I don't know. Let me pray about that. I may have to, you know, because may, maybe I could work that out with you. Hang on. Do, do you understand? If somebody walked in that door and said, I'll give you $10 if you'll quit preaching the word. Oh, wow, man, I could buy a couple cups of coffee with that. Let me pray about that. I don't even have to pray about that. Is everybody with me? Amen. So, so then he says, listen, it's harder for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven than to pass through the eye of a needle. It was a joke. Not, not, it was a joke with a, 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 a teaching point. It was a parable. It was a proverb. Jesus probably told it with a smile on his face. But yet the young man went away sad. But Jesus was making a point to those around him. This was this guy's stumbling block. You know what Peter's stumbling block was? His boat, his fishing until Jesus got into his heart and he got on his knees and grabbed his feet and said, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. Remember that? And he did. That's why Peter was the first one to open his mouth. Lord, we've given up everything to follow you. And, and Peter pretty much had. I mean, you know, earthly speaking. And the other disciples too. But Jesus reminded them, yeah, but look what you've gained, Peter. 
Look at all the amazing times we've had. Look at the things you've witnessed that nobody ever get to witness. And eventually Peter would understand, look who you sat with around the campfire every night and talked to face to face. You spoke to your creator. Amen. Like Abraham spoke to Yahweh in the flesh. You spoke to your creator. Billions of people will come after you, Peter, who will not get to do that until they enter the kingdom behind the dimensional curtain. Blessed are those who do not see, Peter, but still believe. That's us. And he gives us glimpses of glory all the time, but not like Peter had. And he's out there saying, we left everything, follow you. If I was Jesus, I'd say, there's the road. <laughs> what, you changing your mind now? <laughs> I'm sure Jesus had already had those conversations with him. We've left everything. And Jesus reminds him, yeah, but no, you haven't. Look at all the blessings you've gotten in this life. Your name will go down in history until I come again. People will be reading your name. In fact, you will even write scripture, Peter. You don't, you don't have a clue. You haven't left nothing. And then when you walk through that veil and you see what is there for you, You'll choke on those words, <laughs> and you'll wish you had never spoken them. Do you understand all this as I tie it together? Folks, listen. God's word is God's word, and his rules are his rules, and they speak his heart and his mind. And if we are born again and we're under his blood, we want to keep the family rules. We want to be obedient children of God because we want his love on us. We want his blessings that he bless, would bless us with. How many blessings have we forfeited because even as a child of God, we've wandered off into disobedience, into stupidity and, and when he was just getting ready to pour out something and we stepped right out from under it and went on because we clinging to the stuff of the world, and the stuff of the flesh. Ah. And it breaks his heart like it does our hearts as parents or grandparents. When our children, we're getting ready to bless them. They don't know it. We're getting ready to surprise them. And then they come up and say, I hate you. Whoops. There goes that blessing. Am I right? <laughs> with some of you, I'm more right than with others. I, can, I, I see and hear the reactions, but generally I'm right. <laughs> If we then, being sin, sinful, know how to do good things and know how to discipline our children in love and know how, to, how much more our Father in heaven who is perfect in every way, he doesn't wink at our sin. It breaks his heart because sometimes we forfeit blessings. But what he wants to do is to restore us and to keep living in the family life. So at the end of it all, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You knew me and I knew you. What about the laws? They were written on your heart. You did a pretty fair job of either sticking to them or desiring with all of your heart to, stumbling along the way and coming back to me because you're my child. So how were people in the Old Testament saved? The same way we are, through the blood of Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus said, no, they were looking forward to the Lamb of God that would come. You know how we're saved? We look backwards 2,000 years on the Lamb of God who did come. See? You say, well, how are they looking forward? It would be 2,000 years. How are you trusting in a man that hung on a cross in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? Because the empty tomb. Do you understand? Amen. They were saved by faith. And God gave them glimpses of glory along the way. And he gave them the family laws which were given at Sinai. And the Bible says 10,000 times 10,000 angels smoke and fire covered that mountain. They were so afraid they heard the voice of God. They looked at Moses and said, I'm just going to use our language. Tell him to shut up. He's scaring us to death. Some of us have wet our britches a little bit. Moses, why don't you go up there and talk to him? The Bible says that a little nicer than that. But the Bible says that. Oh, they, they, had, they had things that solidified their faith to believe in, but it was all pointing to the Christ who was to come, the Messiah who was to come. Our faith is now in Jesus who went to Calvary's cross, rose from the grave to prove that he is who he is. Amen. The next verses after where we just stopped and 
He t- it says, and then after that, it says, then once again, remember they're on their way. He told his disciples that they were on their way up to Jerusalem where evil people would crucify him. But three days later, he would rise from the grave. You see, that's why we're here on Sunday mornings on the Lord's Day. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate what he did for us. We celebrate that he delivered us from this notion of bondage to the law. And then whoever interprets the law, we're living in that in our nation, aren't we? I mean, you, you, you don't need to live in some bondage that there's 600 rules that this church has. And so you come here to find out how to live them because I'm the only one that has the secrets. And I make up other secrets to go around the 600. So every Sunday, you got to come back and find out what my secrets are. That would be pure slavery. That would be a cult. Aren't you glad you don't have that bondage? We all come in here because we're under the blood of Jesus. We sing his praises, not Carl's praises, not this church's. We sing Jesus' praises. We serve him. We love him together. I'm just set aside as a guy that preaches and teaches and helps to lead and worship. Those are my gifts. A lot of you have other gifts, but together we're one body in Jesus Christ, and we're here because of what Jesus did for us. The law, yes, it's important. They are the family rules, and we cling to the desire to serve and to honor our Lord. We know his word so that we can accurately handle the word of truth and so that we can please our Father. But so much of it is written on our hearts that we don't even have to pray about most of it, folks. Because we're, we belong to the Lord. Now listen to me. So the world is filled. Our county is filled with people. And I'm not anybody's judge. Please hear me. Just because somebody's not in church doesn't mean they're not saved or they don't love Jesus. I understand that. I'm just saying that Lord's Day after Lord's Day after Lord's Day after Lord's Day after Lord's Day, some of it for years and years, some of it for decades and decades, you'll find people around this kind of, well, I love the Lord, so I'm going to heaven. That's all I need. No, I don't need none of that other stuff. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not the judge of their heart, but my goodness, I know one thing you're missing in your life. That's <laughs> what Jesus told that guy, right? I'm just telling you, folks, human nature is such. 9-11 hit, we, we had standing room only. After things got back to normal, we had space for the rest of the county to sit in here. Dare I say COVID hit? There were several Sundays in the heat of the whole thing, you couldn't hardly find a place to sit in here. Now that it's calmed down a little bit, people are dealing with it. Now it's back to normal. They realize it ain't going to go away. We're just going to deal with it. It's back to normal. I'm just, I'm just, I'm not the judge. I can't read people's minds and hearts. And some people have good reasons. But I'm just saying, folks, there's something about a reality to your walk with Jesus or just a spare tire mentality. I'll call on him when I need him. And there's a big difference in not everybody who just says, Lord, Lord, will enter the What good thing must I do? You can't even keep the laws. That's what he was saying to me. You're a ruler of a synagogue. You might be fooling people, but you're not fooling me. And let me prove it in front of everybody. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he said, I can't do that. And he went away sad. Does this make sense? Amen. All right, this is a heart check on all of us. Isn't it? I'm just going to go ahead and tell you while I'm preaching, and I'm not going to tell you which parts. While I'm preaching, the Lord was screaming in my ear, that's you, boy. See, all of us, all of us have to check our hearts before the throne of God. And then you'll know. But I'm telling you, folks, we're living in prophetic times. We're living in a crazy world. Don't give up. Don't wander back to the world. It's so easy. It's so easy just to cling to what we would say is normalcy or accept it as normal. Supreme Court said, ah, gay marriage is okay. Almost all the churches and almost all God's people say, ah, it's normal now. Never has been normal with God. I could just go down the list. Well, you know, Roe v. Wade, I mean, abortion, that's um, your body, my choice. Yeah, until somebody wants me to shove a vaccine in me that's not even approved. And all of a sudden, it's not my body, my choice. You see the hypocrisy and 
It, that's, that's not how we do life. What we do life is we stand in God's word, we seek his face, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we stay faithful, and we fight the fight, we finish the race, and we keep the faith to the very end because we know him and he knows us. Praise be unto Jesus Christ, our Savior. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Bow your heads with me.